Hello, I'm Carl Seddon and I'm the manufacturer of Elixir Probiotic and Tribal Prebiotic. Welcome to my video series on gut health. In this series I'm going to start from the very basic and work towards very in-depth uh, on the topic of how gut health affects total body health or more specifically how the microbes in our gastrointestinal tract affect our overall bodily health. There are articles and pieces of uh, medical literature coming out every day on gut health it seems. Today is the 2nd of December 2016 and I was reading an article earlier about a more concrete connection that's been found between microbes and Parkinson's by an international group of scientists and researchers. Right now is the perfect time to start to learn about the topic and this video series is designed to explain from the very basic concepts all the way to the in-depth concepts uh, using um, a slow progression of, of, of teaching so that everyone can learn, even if you're a no complete novice to science or to this area. So, so the way it's designed is that you can hopefully keep track all the way through and you'll end up learning things that previously you would have just completely assumed that you would never have had a chance of, of understanding. So this first episode is the introduction to the series. It's an overview of why this is going to be so interesting to you and why it's going to be so relevant to the future of health, of human health. It's a manifesto of sorts. So without any further ado, please enjoy. So many conditions prevalent in modern times, cancer, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, neurological disorders, affect such an alarmingly large portion of the human population that this surely cannot be an allowable proportion that's resulted from natural selection during our evolution. So it must be the result of some modern influence that did not occur in our past and therefore was not there to be a survival pressure in the first place. A survival pressure being some fact that a species evolves to accommodate for by the process of survival of the fittest, like how an antelope adapted to have eyes on the sides of their heads to give them better peripheral vision to keep a watch for hungry lions while they graze. Even if you think that it is simply the fact that we humans now live longer Thus, these conditions simply now have more time to present themselves, it would not explain the numerous conditions that affect the young just as frequently. Allergies, skin conditions, short-sightedness, epilepsy, autism, IBS. Teenage acne is a good example of a totally pointless condition. Why would a human, at one of the most important times to appear attractive to the opposite gender, from an evolutionary point of view, be riddled with a skin condition that makes the subconscious brain of their peers believe they have a contagious disease, never mind attracted to. Obviously acne is not contagious, but the subconscious brain perceives it as such. If acne had been so common prior to the last few decades, we would have evolved to see it as a normal display of adolescence. Just as we do not perceive boldness on a baby the same way we view it on a prematurely balding 25-year-old, because on a baby is a normal feature of being so young that has been present throughout our evolutionary history. After all, evolution has crafted us so finely in other ways, such as even the eyelashes on our upper eyelid curve upwards, and the lashes on our lower eyelids curve downwards. Now is that really such a great advantage compared with them just growing straight out? It would seem not for a single individual in a single lifetime, but that's how evolution works. The many millions of generations and many billions of individuals involved do result in evolution achieving such well-honed creatures, so well adapted to their environment, beyond what would appear necessary. With all that honing in mind, why would evolution then go and result in something like one in five being visually impaired? For all the perfection it creates, why on earth would it be allowable that such a high proportion of our species can't even see properly? It could only be an extremely rapid change in environment that causes such widespread problems to occur within the species. A change so rapid that evolution cannot keep pace to produce sufficiently adapted individuals, like a sudden climate change or even more sudden, an asteroid impact, pretty hard to evolve to survive a change that rapid. Humans are so advanced that we now adapt the environment to ourselves as opposed to the other way around, which is fantastic obviously, but some adaptations may unwittingly be counter to our biological design, certain food items being in abundance or being present at all certain activities, certain pharmaceuticals, and it is my belief that the most significant determinant of our overall health is the effect that these modern influences have had on the microbes within our gut. This series will explain how the microbes in our gut affect our health 
and lead to all these different conditions? And what factors have led to the disruption in the first place? And of course, a great focus will be placed on how to resolve these problems entirely. It is not convincing enough to simply say that there is some relationship between our microbiota and our health. We want to know the exact mechanisms. How does it do it? Why doesn't everyone with a dysbiotic gut experience the same symptoms? What causes one person to have insomnia, pollen allergy, but fantastic skin, while another person may have terrible eczema, yet they sleep like a baby and they're not allergic to anything? I am interested in tackling all of these things, no matter how seemingly benign. Things like hair loss, problem sleeping, being overweight, or being unable to build muscle. Some of those may be seen as not real medical problems, but they are all significant to me, and all of them will be resolved now, or in the very near future. It's very apparent from general observation that different people react to an identical diet in a different way. Simple example being, eating the same number of calories does not always induce the same level of fat gain in two different individuals. The layman explanation for this is usually something to do with metabolic rate. An overweight person has a slow metabolism, assumably for genetic reasons. Another explanation is the more vague response, genetics. Obviously, in the specific case of weight gain, there are people who will assign obesity to something outside the physiological realm altogether and say it's some kind of gluttony. And so a stronger will is all that is required to lose weight. This is a useless conclusion, because even if it were simply due to increased appetite and cravings, then that in itself is the physiological dysfunction that needs to be corrected. It's not a choice that someone would willingly make to be always hungry or craving a certain food. Actually, I can tell you right now, from all my experiments with manipulating my own gut microbes, that severe cravings, for sugar in particular, can be generated by a dysbiosis. In fact, I brought it about in myself at various points in my experiments tinkering with various things that affect the profile of microbes in my gut. So the main cause for these different responses to the same diet, I think, is the difference in the profile of microbes in your gut. And a bit more specifically, the presence of pathogenic, i.e. bad microbes, in your intestine. How exactly they mediate all these health conditions is what this series is all about. Back to diets for a moment. I think a lot of people do so well on a low-carb diet, not because it is the one natural human diet we are evolved to eat, or even that there is a concomitant decrease in calories from the reduction in available food choice. I think it's because it concomitantly decreases the amount of fermentable material, i.e. fibre, that reaches the intestine and is eaten by microbes, because most carbohydrate sources are also fibre sources. So a reduction in whole food carbohydrates tends to decrease fibre intake as well. If these microbes that the fiber is feeding are pathogenic, i.e. they're bad, then cutting their food supply by going low carb and therefore low fiber causes huge improvements across various conditions because it starves the pathogenic microbes. It also starves the beneficial microbes. So the low fiber approach can be an effective rapid band-aid solution, but not a good long-term option. I went on an effectively zero carb diet for a long time a few years ago and it was an absolute breakthrough for me in terms of my IBS symptoms and my brain fog and skin. Now, bear in mind I said that it's not the one natural human diet. I'm not actually saying that low carb is unnatural. In fact, I think there is a huge range of completely different diets which are all natural and we can thrive on any of them. For example, all meat, all plant-based, even just all fruit. I think correlations between something as simplistic as the carbohydrate protein fat ratio of a diet and medical conditions is overlooking the fourth macronutrient fiber and the critical mediating factor which is the profile of microbes in your gut. When talking about natural and non-natural diets it's not about carbohydrate fat protein ratio it's more about specific components for example cooking oil, trans fat, gluten, lectins man-made substances or substances that are only available to eat in any significant quantity because of a relatively modern food production process. Even so, I do think a lot of modern introductions to the human diet are absolutely fine if you do not have a gut dysbiosis. I think when the human gut is healthy, you can throw a lot of different food substances at it and it will extract something good and protect the body from the harmful, including wheat products. They've been around for a long time and the huge jump in metabolic syndrome conditions is far more recent. 
So the causative factor for the boom in these so-called diseases of westernized society is more likely to be something a lot more recent than wheat consumption. Although, I do tend to think that the further back in time we can replicate, dietarily speaking, while still being human of course, the better that diet will be for your health. Think about how many people you know who can eat anything and have perfect skin, or eat as much as they want and not become overweight. Think about how clean some people eat in terms of avoiding greasy junk food, and yet they still have acne. Maybe you are a guy or girl trying to gain muscle and you do everything right, you hit the gym every day, you eat the supposedly correct diet, everything is researched and prepared meticulously. All this time and all this precision, and you may not even look like you lift weights. You're not lean, you've got no muscle, you've got fat around your chest, you're not even particularly strong. And I can go to where I live in Uganda and pick any random 20 year old Ugandan guy and he'll be more lean and more muscular than he's never been in the gym in his life. The difference is gut health and the systemic effect it has on total body health. As an aside, since I mentioned Uganda, it may be interesting to researchers in this field that I think the health of Ugandans is going to decrease significantly over the next few decades uh, on its current path due to the ubiquitous availability of over-the-counter antibiotics and the lack of understanding or regulation on the pharmacists that sell them. Ugandans were and still are an archetype of intestinal health and quite a bit of epidemiological study in the gastroenterology field is done in Malago, which is a hospital in Kampala, the capital of Uganda. Uh, so, you know, I've been in Uganda and um, I've seen people just walk into these pharmacies and ask for Ampiclox, uh, an antibiotic, just because they've got a sore throat. So, you know, and they just pass it over the counter. No questions asked, um, no test done, just no guidelines given, just they give the antibiotic. The differences in health between two different individuals is actually for the same reason that there is a difference in response between two different people trying the same diet. It's all due to the difference in the microbes in their gut. Trying to tackle the resulting conditions with acne cream, antihistamines or dietary measures is like ice skating uphill until you correct your gut dysbiosis. There's an observation that epilepsy is well treated on a ketogenic diet, i.e. a very very low carbohydrate diet. And I think the current belief of why it is effective remains to be that the brain switches over to using ketones for energy rather than glucose when you eat so few carbohydrates. And this has some effect on brain activity and thus epilepsy. Personally, I think it is due to the denying of certain fibers, uh, such as uh, the fermentable portions of starch, and thus the starving of the pathogenic microbes that were causing the epilepsy in the first place. Because a very low carbohydrate diet will likely be low in fermentable material too, i.e. low in fiber for, the, for microbes in your gut to eat. If the idea of microbes in your gut causing something like epilepsy seems a bit far-fetched, then stay tuned because I'm going to be covering all the amazing connections between the gut and the brain and the gut and everything else. For arthritis, skin conditions, allergies, metabolic disorders, etc, genetics are not holding you back. An overgrowth of pathogenic microbes in your gut is holding you back. Why is this so prevalent in modern society? You probably know a few causes already. Antibiotics and other pharmaceuticals, modern diet, even chronic stress. But there are many more. In fact, one of the most significant causes in my mind is your inherited gut microbiota. Gut microbiota meaning the profile of microbes in your gut. It's not inherited genetically. Moreover, you are inoculated during birth. So, the health of your mother's gut during your birth, or whether or not you were born via caesarean section, will have a huge impact in the foundation of your present day microbiota. More on that coming up in this series. The reason why the Human Genome Project didn't unearth anywhere near as many medical insights as was expected is because we were assaying the less revealing genome all along. The gut microbiome, the genomes of the microbes in our gut, holds far more answers. This concludes my general overview and introduction to this video series. To dive into the fascinating revelations about how gut health affects our entire body, we must lay the groundwork for understanding. And the best place to begin is by discussing why our gut contains microbes in the first place. To view the next episode now, click on this button next to the video. If the next episode has not yet been released, or if you just want to take a break from watching and continue later, I have set up an email notification service. Type your email address in the box next to this video and I will let you know when a new episode comes out. In the welcome email you will also receive a link to all of the episodes that are currently available, 
so you can watch them at your convenience. If you are watching this on YouTube, then these links will be provided below the video in the description section or via the clickable annotation shown here.